today's talk. It's entitled, What's Fair is Fair. Uh, this spring, the Dance Heritage Coalition presented the results of a multi-year project to develop a new statement of fair use for dance-related materials. And the mission of the Dance Heritage Coalition is to improve the ability of the dance community uh, to access and to use dance-related materials. And what came of this research and all of these findings is this booklet. It is the Statement of Best Practices in Fair Use of Dance-Related Materials. Materials. There are copies, you'll notice, dotted throughout the room here. So feel free, uh, after the talk, to pick one of these copies up. They're free of charge. Uh, and with me today on the panel is uh, Peter Yazzie. He is faculty director of the Glushko Samuelson Intellectual Property Law Clinic, and he is professor of law at Washington College of Art. Uh, he holds expertise in intellectual property and copyright law, and he is fondly called also copy, copyright scholar extraordinaire. <laughs> Dean Jeffrey is archivist at American Dance Festival, and Norton Owen, uh, Many of you know Norton. He is Director of Preservation here at Jacob's Pillow since 1990. Uh, I should mention that both uh, Norton and Dean are associated with the Dance Heritage Coalition. They are on the board and they've been very keen and much part of the development of this particular project. I think what's important, uh, perhaps just to start off, Peter, if we could have just a definition of what is fair use. Thank you, Philip. So, uh, let me back up a little bit and offer you another definition to lead into the definition of fair use, and that's the definition of copyright law. Copyright law is a, a set of rules. They exist in, in, they exist in all countries, and, and very much so in the United States, that give artists and sometimes also businesses rights in created material, in dance and film and text and image and just about every kind of created material you can imagine, motion pictures and, and so forth. And in the last 25 years or so, the law of copyright has become a much bigger issue in the, the, in, in the daily life of many of us than it has ever been before. We talk about it more, we hear about it more. Uh, it's partly because of the internet and the stresses and strains on the copyright system that the internet has created. And it's partly because, frankly, there's bigger and bigger money in this field. And copyright owners are more and more interested in protecting their rights. And, and generally speaking, legislatures and judges are willing to go along with that project. So copyright has become a more restrictive set of rules and regulations than it's ever been before. And in many ways that's good. That means that creative people and companies that invest in creative enterprises can earn money back from what they do and that as a result they will do more because the point of copyright, and it's written right into the Constitution, is to promote the progress of culture. The trouble is that sometimes the, the system of rights in almost every imaginable kind of creative activity can become too restrictive. It can become so restrictive that it actually gets in the way of new cultural production. Because as we all know, there aren't many new cultural products, new dances, new films, new music, that are wholly new. Everything builds on what went before. And in a copyright environment that's too restrictive, the risk is that instead of actually promoting cultural production, copyright may begin to inhibit cultural production. And that's where fair use comes in. Fair use is a, a doctrine that exists in the law of the United States and under that name in the law of a, a few other countries around the world, the most recent country to adopt a fair use provision and its national law is Israel. It doesn't exist under that name in most countries around the world, and we'll talk later perhaps about what other countries have that plays the, the same functional role as fair use. But in the United States, what fair use teaches 
as a legal doctrine is that sometimes it's okay for a creator or a scholar or a teacher or someone else who's making new culture to use existing copyrighted material without permission and without paying a license fee. And that time is when the use is more beneficial, culturally beneficial, or even economically beneficial than whatever costs the use may impose on the copyright owner. It's a balancing act, in effect. And this is, this is great, and it's been around. It's been part of US law since 1841, when judges first worked this doctrine into the fabric of our law. It was recognized by Congress in 1978, but there's a problem with it. And the problem is that this doctrine, which was designed to be very dynamic, very flexible, to keep up with the times, to keep up with changes in culture, to keep up with changes in technology, is, is by virtue of that fact, by virtue of its, 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 its dynamism and its generality, also a little hard to pin down. And very often, the working artist or the working teacher or the working archivist says, well, I know I have fair use rights. I know I have rights to quote pre-existing copyrighted material in, in my new dance or in my new film or in my course of lectures or in my archival materials, but I really don't know what the extent of those rights are. And, and this project is a project that's designed to give some so, to put some flesh on the, on the bones of fair use, to give some specificity and some real meaningful guidance about what is and what isn't fair use in a particular area of practice. One of the things that uh, was put forward when the, uh, when the statement was launched in uh, May of this year was uh, project director Libby Smeagol. She uh, made the comment that uh, one reason archival uh, materials remain out of sight, both to the public as well as to researchers, is this confusion over copyright uh, and the fear of lawsuits that come about. And in her quote, uh, she says, uh, it hasn't been clear how librarians, archivists, and curators can legally use images and texts. Maybe both Dean and Norton, you can talk about this particular issue, both in terms of what happens here, but as well as what happens at the American Dance Festival. Well, I can give you an example from, from my own experience of uh, observing some of our colleagues in the, in the coalition um, uh, about exhibitions, for instance. Of course, I do all the exhibitions here. Uh, one analogous thing would be to mention the photo exhibit that's in the reading room there of photos of Alvin Ailey, uh, where we've got a number of photographs that were taken in the 50s and 60s. Um, there are photographs. I put them on the wall, as simple as that. Uh, I found a few years ago at, uh, at uh, one of our colleague institutions in San Francisco, uh, they were doing a Balanchine exhibit and uh, they were asking permission for each thing, that they, each photograph they were hanging on the wall, they were asking permission of the photographer and of the people in the photograph and of the Balanchine Foundation and I just thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't have, I w all of Jacob's Pillow wouldn't have a staff big enough to do that kind of uh, work on beha every time I wanted to hang something on the wall. So uh, I, I hasten to say they don't do that anymore, but uh, that was a real good example to me of how two different institutions would have a totally different way of approaching something that they thought was, well, this is what we do, you know, when this is our procedure. Yeah, yeah, my experience at the American Dance Festival is much like that. What the, what the statement of fair use really allows me to do is I have people come to me and say, I would like to use this photograph in this book. And like Norton says, there's other, there's other copyright holders, usually the photographer. Sometimes there's an agency that the photographer worked for, and it's kind of unclear who and how many people you have to ask. And so when somebody wants to use a photograph out of our collection, I can often... Well, I always start it with, I'm not a copyright lawyer, so don't take this as, as, as you know, gospel. But I can share with them the, the fair use guidelines and say, you know, here's what, here's what we follow. You should be able to do the same thing. So it frees up, uh, it gives them the ability to use things from our archives. Whereas before, it's like you said, people, when they weren't sure, they would just go, uh, I, I don't know if
if you can use that or not. Peter? And of course, the, that institution that shall not be named in San Francisco wasn't being entirely silly because one of the things the copyright law does is that it gives copyright owners an exclusive right of display. So technically, an unauthorized display, which is what we do when we hang an image on a wall, is a potential copyright violation. Why isn't that a copyright violation in this case? Well, probably because of this fair use doctrine we're talking about. Probably because the, the cultural value that flows from being able to show to the public all of the things that are part of an institution's collection so far outweighs whatever harm to the owner of the photographic copyright or to the owner of the choreographic copyright might flow from that use that we say, uh, balance, do it. Mm -hmm. The problem with dance materials, and this is one of the things we discovered in the very early stages of this project, is that they're like a sort of thick layered sandwich of copyrights. If you have documentation of a dance of the kind that archival institutions in the Dance Heritage Coalition and other similar institutions which are not part of the coalition hold, those objects may implicate a whole series of different rights, choreographic rights, rights of photographers and videographers, rights of the composers of music that is employed in the dance that has been videotaped or filmed, rights of costume designers, rights of set designers. And if every one of those rights has to be cleared for every institutional use of every item in the collection, then many collections are going to do what we discovered they were doing, and that is very very little. They were doing their best to take good care of what they held and to allow people who came physically to their sites to see the material individually and that was about it. We even found some institutions that were afraid to preserve material. Why? Because if you make an archival copy of a photograph you're literally making a reproduction and one of the exclusive rights of the copyright owner the photographer, perhaps, in this case, is, of course, the right of reproduction. Why is it okay for an institution which has as its mission the preservation of dance culture to do that kind of preservation copying? Well, again, it's a function of fair use. Is this why, for instance, uh, the Harvard law professor uh, and copyright expert Charles Neeson, he commented that, or wrote that fairness is a standard, not a rule? That's an interesting quote. And, and um, I, I f what it captures for me, and I think captures it very well, is that this concept of fair use that we're talking about, this balancing concept, can't really be re reduced to any fixed or set formula. Sometimes in, in some fields you'll hear, oh well, someone told me that it's okay to copy 10% of something or three bars of music. My favorite or is when it's, it's, it's a certain number of words. They say you can copy 25 yeah. words before you have to attribute the... Right, the exactly. And all that stuff, that is the urban folklore of copyright. Mm -hmm. It has absolutely no basis in law or fact, but it circulates, and it circulates for a reason. And the reason is that people want something to hold on to. They want some source of certainty. They want something they can work with. Now, when, when Charlie Nesson says, well, it's a standard, what he really means, I think, it may be putting words in his mouth by saying this, is that it's a way of thinking about a problem. It isn't a formula, but it is an analytic process. And what we try to do in projects like this one, this statement of fair use best practices for dance collections, is to articulate that process, that way of thinking or way of analyzing for different use communities. The first community we did this with, and when I say we, I mean myself and my colleagues, especially my colleague Pat Ofterheide in the communications department at American University. The first group we did this was documentary filmmakers. Mm -hmm. They had a terrible problem. They were, they were all tied up in copyright knots about what they could and couldn't quote, about whether or not they could allow uh, 
snatch of music that was playing in the background of a cinema verite scene to find its way into the final cut of a movie, and they needed help. But of course, they couldn't help, we couldn't help them. We couldn't tell them, okay, these are the rules. They had to help themselves. But it, it was a process. But it's interesting, in the case of documentary filmmakers, uh, every documentary that is created or produced, uh, you need to get uh, what's called E&O insurance, errors and omissions insurance. And if you don't have that particular thing for every element of your film, you will not get your insurance. So it places the filmmaker in a very, uh, I'd say it's a dance documentary, in a very dubious position. It does. And five years ago when we began this work, uh, it was the case that most of the five or six major underwriters who sell this errors and emissions insurance simply wouldn't insure a documentary project that relied on fair use. They would either deny it insurance completely or they would grant an insurance policy with exclusions for the scenes that relied on fair use. <laughs> Not the most useful policy you might want to buy, but still very expensive. Uh, and Thanks to the fact that documentary filmmakers got together and articulated for themselves with some, some professional help from us a set of shared standards and values around the issue of what was and wasn't good practice, all of that's changed. And now documentary filmmakers regularly buy errors and emissions insurance, which covers situations in which they have well-justified claims of fair use, as well as situations in which they've licensed rights. My hope for this field, for the field of, of dance archiving, is that this newer statement, which came out only l late last year, is going to have a similar transformative effect on the field. Mm -hmm. And that we will see over the next four, three or five years, um, a real change in the way in which these wonderful institutions which hold the history of this subject behave with respect to making that material available to the world. Uh, Norton, uh, last year, or was it two years ago, uh, the Dance Heritage Coalition put forward American, America's Irreplaceable Treasures, and there are a couple of terrific examples of the problematic surrounding this whole issue. I mean, one of them concerning uh, a photograph of the famed African dancer, Asadata Defora. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk to that. Well, we, I was the co-curator of an exhibit on America's Irreplaceable Dance Treasures that was, um, it was um, produced by the Dance Heritage Coalition, but we showed it here. Some of you may remember it several years ago. Um, more than two, Philip, but yes, that's all right. Yeah. Um, seems like yesterday, but anyway. Um, but actually, all of the work that we did on that exhibit, my co-curator, Lynn Garofola, and myself, uh, <laughs> mistakenly we're thinking, oh, well, we'll just pick the things that we think are the best things to include in this exhibit and our work will be, will be done. But of course, we found out that there were a lot of other factors to consider, like would we be able to get the rights, and which hadn't occurred to us first of all because we thought, well, it's gonna be shown in libraries. Uh, it was going to be not only here at the Pillow but also at the San Francisco Performing Arts Library Museum at Ohio State and at the New York Public Library, who has probably as many lawyers as the people sitting in this room. <laughs> and that, their whole raft of lawyers said, well, this is lovely that you're doing this exhibit. Make sure you get um, permissions for everything in the exhibit, um, particularly all of the moving image material where we wanted, of course, to show dance, and imagine that, actually being able to see dance in this exhibit. And one of the ways that we wanted to show it was from films, uh, many of which were in the collection of the New York Public Library, so they owned it. All we wanted to do was to show it, uh, but the lawyer said, well, that's fine, but you have to get permission for everything. We had to hire somebody who worked for six months on this, so this was not a cheap undertaking. And some of the things that we found out, well, we actually had to make, Lynn and I had to make different choices, which was something that just sent me ballistic. I thought, okay, now I will, ha I will be judged for the, the clip I have chosen 
when it really wasn't the clip I wanted to show at all. It was the clip that I had permission to use. The, the greatest example of that was um, we wanted to show Mark Morris. Um, uh, Lynn wanted to use something from the hard nut. I totally concurred that would be a great thing. And because Mark Morris was a treasure and the Nutcracker was a treasure, here was a way of covering two different things. So we thought, oh, the snow scene. Oh, we love the snow scene with people barreling across the stage, throwing the snowflakes. That would be just wonderful. Well, there are like 30 people in the snow scene. And according to WNET, who had the rights to this, we had to get a letter from every single per snowflake on that stage. And uh, some of these people no longer danced with Mark Morris. The company had no idea where they were. And uh, long story short, what we ended up doing was choosing something from uh, what they called the French scene. There were four dancers. And it was nowhere near as effective uh, uh, of an excerpt to show as the snow scene. And the reason that it was there was because of, of rights. Expediency as yeah. well. It was yeah. easier to clear. Yeah. yeah, we could find those four people. We knew who they were and we could get to them. And this was a case also where the Mark Morris company was saying, fine, use it. Use the whole, you know, we, we're fine with it. But WNET was not fine with they had to have us you know have a letter from each person there's a great story too attached to the chorus line the film a chorus line from 1985 which most people think is an mgm film but in fact was in fact a nightmare yeah and well all of the things that had to do with motion picture uh you know forget wnet all the things that had to do with um movie companies uh there's something which of course Peter can tell you much more about, but there's something that we discovered called most favored nation status, which we thought was kind of funny because we didn't realize there was a nation of dance, but apparently we could be considered, um, we could be considered a most favored nation, and uh, that meant that if we um, paid anything to any rights holder, we would have to pay that amount to everybody who had signed uh, this agreement with us. And uh, uh, of course, we didn't find this out first thing out of the starting block, block because nobody uh, wanted to tell us that uh, from the get-go. They would just say, oh, well, that'll be you know $500 per second or whatever it was uh, to use this. And, uh, and then we found out about the most favored nation status. But then it was, as what Philip is alluding to, is you had to find the corporate entity that existed that was in charge of it, even though they may not have been the company who had produced the film, but they were the, the entity because the company had been bought by somebody else by so, yes, the yeah. conglomerates and such. This is, uh, this is a tremendous problem in the rights clearance uh, field. Whatever kind of project we're talking about, whether it's a dance exhibition or a documentary film, uh, when you begin with the proposition that every right in every image or every text or every bit of moving footage has to be cleared, then what you are setting yourself up for is this recurrent problem in which you cannot locate the person who has the authority to give the clearance. And it is in that such kind of situation, perhaps most of all, that a fair and, and, and balanced understanding of fair use and a willingness to apply it, a willingness to say, well, maybe this is a use that can be made without clearing any rights is important. Uh, it comes in handy in other situations, too. It, it, can, it can sometimes mean the difference between having a, a reasonable budget for rights clearances on the one hand and being stuck with a bill that will literally sink the project on the other. So there are many practical reasons why this is important. It also is not unusual, and I'm sure, Norton, that, that you and Lena ran into this too, to have people who are in control of the rights to material you want to include in a project say, no, uh, I don't like the project, I don't think we're getting uh, an enough, enough uh, attention in the project. Uh, or for some other whimsical or quixotic reason, simply to refuse. And that's another situation in which knowing your fair use rights can be very important. 
Mm. One of the aspects of this is just in terms of money and time and labor. Dean, I mean, in your particular situation, do you have a fleet of uh, you know, drones who, who can go about doing all this business for weeks on end? No, I, I have me. Uh, <laughs> and that's it. So when, when somebody wants to use something that's in my collection and, and you know, I basically say, you know, you're in charge of securing the rights, you know, here's my advice on how to go about that. But if I, you know, if I spend the time to even look up what name is rubber stamped on the back of the photograph or give them the list of all the people that might conceivably be the rights holders, like Peter was saying, costume designers, lighting designers, set designers, choreographers, musicians in, in a piece of film or video, you know, that can just take forever. So if I'm able to say to that person, you know, I think that your usage falls under fair use, it just eliminates all that having to look up that myriad number of people that might be rights owners for that, mm. that, particular, that particular piece. One of the things that's come into our lives, of course, is uh, the internet. And YouTube, which was founded in uh, 2005, uh, is watched by more than 70 million people on its site each day. Uh, YouTube uh, has a number of community guidelines with respect to uh, copyright and other legal issues. Uh, it does not vet the copyright status of each posted video. Uh, its guidelines do include statements like, we trust you be responsible and respect copyright. But um, what about a space like YouTube and what it means in terms of infringing uh, copyright, for instance. Well, this is, I think, is a, an, inc an extremely important point because one of the things we discovered as we, we worked on this project with Dance Heritage Coalition is that many of the institutions that hold the history of dance are extremely interested in developing individually or collectively a presence on the internet. And one of the reasons they're interested is that dance is already on the internet. You don't have to go far on YouTube to find all sorts of dance material, some quite marvelous and some, some, some quite questionable, and all of it offered in effect in the context of no context. Uh, and one of the things that the collections would very much like to do is to make quotations, examples, samples, and illustrations of the history of dance in general and American dance in particular available online with, in a frame, in a, in a context that is richer than the one that, that YouTube offers. But there is a lot of fear in the world about the use of material on the internet, a, a belief, I think it, it's fair to say, that somehow the rules on the internet are different from the rules in physical space, that copyright operates more restrictively in the internet environment than in the print and paper, bricks and mortar environment. Now, we could speculate for a long time on why that belief is present. I think it's because we simply hear so much about copyright enforcement in the internet environment, but it isn't true. It's a complete misapprehension. In fact, one of the wonderful things about copyright in general and the fair use doctrine in particular is that they operate in a way that is not platform specific. In other words, if it were a fair use to mount an exhibit, a curated exhibit, of dance photographs from a particular era here in Blake's Barn, it would be equally a fair use to present that exhibit on a website. Mm -hmm. There is no analytic distinction in law between those two cases. The technologies are different and the potential reach obviously, of the, the latter is far more than the potential reach of the former, as the example of YouTube shows, but analytically, there is no distinction. And one of the things that you'll see when you read the, uh, the Statement of Best Practices is that the fifth topic in the Statement of Best Practices has to do with web-based uses mm -hmm. of, of copyrighted material held by dance collections. And it is that principle of the statement, perhaps more than any others, 
of, or any of the others that I really look forward to be being utilized and, and, and made much of in, in years to come. Wouldn't you think that, uh, that some of the reason for the, the, the um, different kind of standards in dealing with the internet is that uh, it's so easy to rip it off? I mean, if, if, if you were, you mentioned the difference of an exhibit, a physical exhibit here versus one that's on the web. But when I put a photograph on the wall here, I don't have to be uh, worried that somebody's going to take it off the wall and then put it on their wall. Uh, at, whereas you do, in a sense, have to worry about that somebody taking it off of your website and using it in some way. That's a really interesting observation, and I think it's true. Although I also think it's a matter of degree. Unless you, you unless you have rules strict rules against photography in your exhibits, and unless you actually enforce those rules, uh, then the same risk exists yeah. in any context. It's just that in the web environment, the risk, if it is a risk, is magnified. But as far as copyright law is concerned, the same principle once again applies in both environments, and that is that someone who is making a legitimate use of material, legitimate because it's licensed, or legitimate because it comes under the fair use doctrine, isn't responsible for wrongful uses that downstream users might make of that material. You're responsible for your conduct, and they're responsible for their conduct. So when Dean gives someone uh, an access to a photograph in the in the archive and says, well, you know, this might be a fair use. I don't really know because I'm not a copyright lawyer. You figure it out. You have no responsibility if they make a bad choice. If they end up putting that that photograph on a cereal box, which would almost certainly and there's, not be. There's actually an agreement that I have people mm -hmm. sign when they use a photograph that says, you know, we're giving you this for your use, but you're responsible for complying with yeah. the law and, yeah. you know, what you and, do is what you And that agreement do. basically restates the default position, which would be present even in the absence of an agreement. What you do with the material is your responsibility. Mm. We were talking earlier, we're going to get to questions in just a few moments. We were talking earlier about how this legislation, copyright legislation, has uh, been enacted in various countries uh, uh, under different names. Yes. Uh, for instance, in the UK, uh, there's an Im imperial copyright uh, that was consolidated in 1911. In Canada, uh, 1924. Again, all under different names here in the States in 76. The distinctions between these countries, yeah. is it more than just uh, a word change, a name change? I think change? it is, but it's complex because, let's put it this way, every national copyright law has some feature built into it which operates as a safety valve on the system in the way that fair use operates as a safety valve in the U.S. copyright system. Every national copyright law has some provision for unlicensed, un, uncompensated use of copyrighted material in situations where the use promotes culture. They go by different names and they have different content. And sometimes national law doctrines that have the same name actually have very different content. So an example, um, in, in most of the, the Commonwealth countries, we don't have fair use we have something called fair dealing. And that's true in UK law, um, and it's true in Canadian law. But if you look at what Canada and the UK have done with that provision since the early 20th century when it was first introduced in statute, it, the differences are like night and day. Uh, Canadian fair dealing law approximates or converges with or is functionally very similar to fair use law in the United States, partly because the Supreme Court of Canada has taken a very progressive view of copyright law and has always in its recent copyright decisions emphasized considerations of public interest and freedom of speech. The courts in the UK have not taken a similar line. Um, and so both Canada and UK have fair dealing provisions. They look pretty similar on their, 
on their face, but in fact, the filmmaker or the scholar can do much more under Canadian fair dealing than they can do under its, its United Kingdom equivalent. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we have a few jurisdictions around the world the um, Philippines is one and Israel is the most recent that have fair use provisions, but it isn't clear that their fair use law, even though it may be literally in the statute book word for word the same as U.S. law, will work out in, in practice in quite the same way. And right now there's a, incidentally a very interesting uh, effort going on in Israel where the fair use provisions are now about two years old. Um, Scholars in many fields are getting together to try to influence the way in which their new fair use provisions are going to be interpreted as they apply to um, academic work, teaching materials, and other scholarly uses. And um, you know, I'm proud to say that the work we've been doing in the United States with best practices and fair use with documentary filmmakers and educators and, and dance archivists has been very influential in the current Israeli environment. It's also had some influence in Canada. Mm -hmm. Canadian documentary filmmakers are right now getting together to create their own statement of best practices that is going to have a functional role in the Canadian fair dealing system, very similar to the one that the 2005 statement in the United States had. Mm -hmm. So yes, they have different names, yes, they have different content, but the differences can be overstated. One of the things uh, we know uh, in terms of dance heritage, one example, one important example, being the Martha Graham Dance Company, uh, Martha Graham's legacy uh, post-death, uh, and the legal issues that ensued. We don't need to go into all the rigmarole that surrounded that, but um, we also witnessed quite recently the death of Merce Cunningham. Now, I'm not suggesting that there's the same uh, kinds of issues at stake, but this notion of the singular choreographer, the singular artist passing, and then what happens to their legacy. Uh, what kind of an issue is this currently in terms of the community and how they're dealing with this notion of copyright and how things are being uh, put forward? Well, I would say that most of that has to do with the different um, culture, let's say, in, in different organizations. I think all you need to see is the different way in which the, the Merce Cunningham Company has announced you know, what they plan uh, in the post-Cunningham years versus what the Graham Company planned. Um, but also, uh, the, the, I, I think a key thing there is uh, planning and and in the Graham uh, case what was most striking to me was that um, that all of that circus could have been avoided had there been clear agreements um, that uh, that Martha Graham in essence left um, a more dramatic uh, <laughs> experience after her life than even she presented during her <laughs> life. Um, partly, and who knows if how much of that might have been um, for, uh, how much forethought might have been in that as well. But, um, but she certainly could have prevented all of that by having an agreement with the company that said, either these are works made for hire and the Graham Company has all the rights in them or these dance works remain my property and I can do with them whatever I wish. Uh, that would have made a big difference. But Norton, don't you think, and I, I asked this question out of ignorance and the answer may really be no, but don't you think that sometimes the, the entities that, that very well-organized choreographers leave after them their foundations or their estates actually behave more restrictively in interpreting their, their and in enforcing their rights than those choreographers themselves would have done during their lifetimes? Oh, no, no question. And I think that, uh, and you see that while they're alive too, um, mm -hmm. that, that oftentimes 
um, that, that the people dealing on behalf of a yes. creative artist are much more restrictive. And then when you finally get to speak to that creative artist themselves, they say, oh, sure, fine. Go right. ahead, go right ahead, use right. it. Mm -hmm. After you've spent the last three months trying to negotiate with their um, manager. And I think in part that's because the estate, the foundation, or the business representative is thinking of that material not as part of a process of creation, but as an asset, as a, as a thing that can be exploited and which it is his or her professional responsibility to exploit. Absolutely, no, no doubt about that. And I think that's one instance also where, where um, uh, you know, the Cunningham Foundation certainly um, is making a judgment based on what are our assets and what would be the future liabilities, let's say, of running a dance company and what's the prudent thing to do, which may have nothing to do with what Merce Cunningham might want to do artistically in terms of having his work carried forward. Hmm. Uh, let's open this up to some of your questions. Yes, sir. So uh, as a documentarian or as an archivist, who would adjudicate the, the, the the realm of possibilities for a particular work or, or a particular item? It's an important question. And the, the, the not so satisfactory answer mm -hmm. is that at the end of the day, the only entity that has the authority to finally and conclusively adjudicate these issues is a court. And at the same time, people in all fields of practice, creative practice, business practice, are always making predictive judgments about what will and won't happen if and when their, their behavior is taken before a court. And the question is, can, in this case, archivists, in other cases, documentary filmmakers, and yet another case that we've worked on, teachers, can they be given the tools that will help them to make reasonably good predictive judgments about likely outcomes? And the reason that's important is that if you have a strong articulated rationale for what you've done, if you can explain it, the likelihood that anyone is ever going to take you to court to challenge it becomes sort of vanishingly small, um, both because rights owners uh, on the whole aren't interested in getting involved in those wrangles, which can be protracted, and the other, I think, more important reason is that they know that in those cases they're likely, at the end of the day, to lose which is the very last outcome that they want. So the idea here is to equip different kinds of information practitioners with tools to make good, responsible, predictive judgments with articulated grounds. And that, as far as we can see, and, and again, we've been, the documentary filmmaker's uh, statement has been in place and has been widely relied on in the field for four years. No one's challenged it. No one's taken anyone to court. No one's even suggested that any documentary filmmaker operating within the four corners of that statement may have made a bad call. It's become, in effect, an, a, an implicit industry standard merely by virtue of existing, which again is what I hope will happen here. Yeah, and I have to say, I think it is happening here in that, speaking I think both for Dean and myself, that having this document is so helpful now because we have, I mean, even though we may not have an adjudicator to go to, but you have a document that, tell, that spells it out. And you can look at this and you can say, oh, okay, well, according to this, it seems like this, is, this yeah. makes sense. And, and you've again, got something giving to back you, it up. What it's giving you is a thought process. Yeah. What it's giving you is a way of analyzing these questions, which will lead to a result which you are then going to be in the position to defend. Okay, so a question about attorneys and their place in all this process and how this particular book, booklet might be of service or of use to that profession. Okay, so I think there are three different kinds of lawyers in this field. Um, Is this a joke, Peter? <laughs> <laughs> I wish it were, Norton. I wish it were. There are people who are really deeply steeped in this material who are, you know, to, to, 
to use a, uh, an overused words, genuinely expert. And, and for most of them, nothing that's in this book is a surprise. Uh, because frankly, there's nothing here that's revolutionary. There's nothing here that's outside the mainstream. There are then, I think, a lot of lawyers working in or for institutions who do dozens of different things. You know, they do insurance contracts and they do, they do slip and fall and they do everything that happens around the place. That's typical, incidentally, of lawyers in universities. They have a very, very big, diverse portfolio. They don't have a great deal of copyright expertise. They don't claim a great deal of copyright expertise. What lawyers in that situation always do, and I don't fault them because it's the same thing I do when someone asks me for legal advice about something which I really don't understand, and that is if I give them an answer at all, I give them a very conservative answer because I don't want to get into trouble, and most of all, I don't want them to get into trouble on my advice. I think a book like this uh, is enormously useful to that community, not, not just because it's a resource, but because it, it, it ought to send them back to the books. It ought to send them back to form their own opinions, which I suspect will end up looking very much like these. Then there is a, an intermediate group. Um, these, are the t these are, speaking of tough nuts, the, the, the hard people to deal with, and those are the people who've been doing this for a long time and think they know more than they do. Um, I'm not confident that this or anything else is going to get through to that population. What will get through to that population, I think, are people from the institutions holding their booklets coming to the lawyers and saying, look, y y you're our lawyers, you represent us. That means your job is to figure out ways to help us do what we want to do. It says here that we can do this. Why are you telling us we can't? And in some cases, that may be effective. Otherwise, we, just, maybe we may just have to wait for sort of genera generational replacement. Uh, to, to, to take effect. Right here. Okay, so a question about the actual timeline for okay. this idea. So, of um, the, 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 the relevant year is 1841. Um, 1841 is the year that Judge Joseph Story, um, later to be Justice, Justice Joseph Story of the Supreme Court, decided a case called Folsom against Marsh about two dueling biographers of George Washington one of whom had ripped off a fair amount of material from the other's earlier biography. And in deciding the rights and wrongs of that ripoff, Justice Story, Judge Story as he was then, created this notion of fair use. Sometimes it's okay to use copyrighted material if, et cetera. And in the end, in fact, the defendant in that case lost. I mean, Judge Story invented the concept, and then he applied the concept and decided that it didn't apply to the case. But uh, that was the event that set the ball rolling. And then it, it, it ran sort of in the background of American copyright law um, for something like 130 years until in 1978, when a big revision of the copyright statute took effect, it became part of the law, and it now can be found in section 107 of the Copyright Act. The other thing that has happened since then is that as the copyright environment has become more, as I was trying to describe it earlier, sort of more restrictive and more burdensome, for scholars, teachers, creators, and others, more and more cases involving fair use has been coming to court. And so we now have quite a lot of information from the courts up to and including the Supreme Court about fair use. And what's interesting is that at the very moment at which copyright law in general has been becoming more and more of a straitjacket, the fair use doctrine has been interpreted more and more liberally. I think because it is the safety valve in the copyright system, in effect. Does this book have any standing in law? Booklet. <laughs> the, the answer is that I believe it does, and we will know for sure when and if 
it's tested. <laughs> Let me explain. We have, as I was saying earlier, 140 or more years of, of experience with judicial interpretation of the Fair Use Doctrine. And if you read all those cases, which I haven't done, incidentally, but I, I know people who have and I rely on them for, for their, their, their insights, one of the things you discover is that when a court asks, is a use fair or not, one of the first things they do is to look to the standards in the field. They look to what the field considers to be fair and reasonable practice. So if a court is going to decide a case involving fair use in trade publishing, there have been a lot of trade publishing fair use cases over the years, one of the questions they want to know the answer to is, well, what do publishers in general do? What's considered to be the standard of the field? If a court is deciding a case in broadcasting, fair use, they want to know what are the broadcasting standards and practices that apply internally within the industry in this field. So I am convinced, and I'm, as I say, I'm relying mainly here on the work of other scholars, but I am convinced that we're push come to shove and we're a fair use case involving dance archiving practices to come to court, one of the first things that the court would do is they'd say, well, what do the archivists think? And this is the evidence, because this wasn't written for dance archivists, this was written by dance archivists. Uh, the professionals, myself and Libby Schmiegel and others who worked on this project, were not making it up. We were listening to the field and organizing what we were hearing from the field about best practices. So for instance, one of the things that you'll find in this document is a great emphasis on attribution, on the importance of always giving credit even when material is used without a license. Now, you won't find that in the statute anywhere. You won't find that in court decisions about fair use in other fields. But archivists felt that it was critical, that it was an ethical imperative. And so what they have said, and what we have faithfully repeated in this document, is that if you're going to exercise fair use in order to mount an exhibition of materials on the walls of your, your gallery, or in order to put material up on the web, or in order to engage in appropriate preservation practice, you must make every effort to do proper attribution. And I would expect that if a case of this kind were to find its way to court, which I think is unlikely, but were it to find its way to court, and were the court, as I expected then would, to look at this document, they would say, well, look, the archivists think attribution is really very important, mm -hmm. so we ought to take that into account in this case, even though it's not written in the law. So I, the, the, the answer to your question is a tentative yes. I wouldn't have done this, I wouldn't be in this business uh, of, of helping different practice groups to produce statements like this if I didn't believe that they had uh, the potential to influence the law itself. So a question about the taping of performances either here at Jacob's Pillow or at American Dance Festival in terms of that kind of copyright issue in terms of set designers or even costume designers or the work itself. Yeah, well we, we have agreements with all of our artists and they allow us to document um, just as we're documenting right now. But uh, we do make sure that we record every performance with the permission of the, of the company. And I have to say with very, very few exceptions, we have been allowed that um, permission by virtually everybody who has been here since 1982. And what that uh, allows us to do is to have it in our archives and to provide it to people in that way. It doesn't allow us to put it on YouTube or uh, do other things with it that it, it said, the agreement simply says we would have to go back and ask them if we were to do something else with it. But it allows us to, to utilize it here, which is, which is great. And we um, have the, the, the video itself says copyright Jacob's Pillow because we copyright the recording. But it's quite clear in our agreement that we're not 
claiming copyright over Paul Taylor's works or something. You know, he still retains the copyright in his dance and uh, Philip Glass still retains the copyright in his music and whatever, whoever else is involved there. I have a very similar agreement. In fact, I think I cribbed most of it from you. <laughs> but, but it, 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 it yeah. <laughs> it essentially says very much the same thing, that we will record it, we will use it for certain purposes, and in our case, that's documentation, that's archiving, that's, uh, we say that we can use it for promotional purposes and fundraising, and we also say that the performing companies can do likewise. Right. Um, they can use it for their promotional purposes, but that any other use, um, if we want to use it for something else, we'll contact them. If they want to use it for something else, they'll contact us, i.e., if anybody wants to sell anything, there has to be a, a new uh, uh, agreement arranged. One final word to you, Peter. Yes, I just wanted to encourage everyone who hasn't done so already to pick up a copy of the statement uh, if, you, if you're interested in pursuing this further because it's actually quite detailed. We've been talking today appropriately and necessarily in very general terms, but I think you'll see when you read the statement itself, it goes really back to the question about how much guidance does a document like this provide, that there's a lot of useful detail that can actually be helpful to people in the field, and we certainly hope that that will be the case. And I would like to say, too, that one of the, the, one of the things about this, just in the same way that uh, we first came, the Dance Heritage Coalition first came to this whole thing because of the Documentary Filmmakers Project, which Peter did with them. And so my fondest hope out of all of this work that we are doing is that somebody looks at what we're now doing in the dance field and says, Oh, gee, we should be doing this for, you know, X community, you know, whatever that might be. And I think that that's a real possibility. I think that over the next year there's going to be a lot of discussion in the, the larger library community about the possibility of doing best practices for a variety of library issues that are now very much contested in copyright law. And if, it, if that should be the case, this is an example of a, of, a, of a group, a specialized group of, of information, information professionals who have taken the lead. So I, I hope that will be so. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Most stimulating discussion. Thanks to all of you. And copies are dotted throughout the, the barn here. Thank you.